Uh, so today we're talking about film and specifically, let's actually jump into this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, oops, not this webinar. That's Vinny. It's probably a great webinar. Uh, <laughs> today, uh, what's today? Today is the 12th and that's this webinar, Get Inspired by the Legends of Photography. So we're, we're talking all about film, film usage, the difference between film and digital, some, some folks who um, shot film famously and so on, and uh, thought processes behind those things. Uh, out of curiosity, is there anyone out there who's shooting film right now, or maybe not literally right now, but still shoots film or has a hybrid workflow between film and digital? Um, because some of the interesting things that you can do with combining a film process and then utilizing, let's say, Silver Effects Pro or Color Effects Pro for the film emulations is you can have pretty consistent results between your film scans and dig you know, uh, or or um, darkroom prints if you're making prints in the darkroom, and then also having uh, your own digital workflow that kind of reflects the same kinds of looks and responses to color and so on. So um, it, yeah, a lot of folks, it looks like are shooting shooting some film here and there, Clive. Uh, Lori says, not anymore, <laughs> understandable. Uh, it is, it can be a bit of a headache. It's a sort of a labor of love. Uh, though there's, there's some really interesting things that you can do. Um, you know, we can talk about resolution and differences of what happens with scanning and um, so on and so forth. But anyways, I realize I haven't even introduced myself my name is Dan Hughes. I'm, um, I was the webinar trainer for Nick Software from 2009 to 2013. And uh, I've since started teaching at the Rochester Institute of Technology, where I, I got my undergraduate degree in advertising photography. And the first year was immersed in film. And previous to that, I had five or six years of, of film experience. And what we had to do is learn all about how film works, uh, the technology of film, how optics work with film and so on and so forth. And so I'm still excited to have opportunities to work with film. Uh, being that I'm in Rochester, New York, we've got Kodak right down the road. And uh, I've been able to partner with them on a few different projects, which has been really, really cool. Um, and with that and with those projects, we shot film. And so that's really exciting because there's so many cool things that you can do with shooting film. Um, or in my case, typically shooting film and digital side by side and then combining hybrid workflows. So, um, but that's a different conversation, I think. Today, we're here to talk about the legacy of and the legends of these different kinds of film stocks and how these things kind of work and the benefits of shooting film compared to possibly shooting digital. So uh, the first thing that I wanna do is just introduce you to the Silver SilverFX Pro interface. I, I see a lot of names in the GoToWebinar control panel who I recognize, thank you for coming out today, but there's some folks who maybe don't have any experience using Silver SilverFX Pro uh, or possibly even launching any of the NIC plugins. So let's, let's start with that and then we'll deviate and talk about um, our very specific stuff pertaining to film. So here I'm I'm within Photo Lab 3 right now. Really powerful piece of software that's put out by DxO and they have uh, very nicely combined usage between Photo Lab as a raw processing and organizational tool with the NIC collection so that we can kind of work with these processes and work with all of these great algorithms and tools that are within Photo Lab 3 and by the way control points that are in Photo Lab. So again, a different conversation, but very exciting because we're able to control the image selectively using the raw information, using the raw data. Uh, we're not doing that today because I wanna just introduce you to Silver Effects and our conversation about film. So <clears throat> I've got my image. I would usually go in and do some post-processing with Photolab. On another image, we actually will do that. Uh, but for now, I wanna show you in the lower right corner of the Photolab interface, um, to enter into the NIC collection, you click this button down here in the lower right, and you get your plugin selector. And I'm just gonna go ahead and click on Silver Effects Pro 2. While that launches, this workflow with Photolab 3, is actually going to be pretty similar to utilizing, let's say, Adobe Lightroom. So you'll have your images within your film strip. You'll have your main sort of photo um, that's showing up in your in your main portion of the interface, the center portion of the interface. Um, and then 
when you launch into Silver Effects or any of the Nick plugins, sorry, is it launched below or behind? Um, you, you will have your original RAW file in your film strip. And then when you're finished with your image editing from uh, Silver Effects or the Nick plugins, you'll have a secondary file. You'll have a TIFF or a JPEG, depending upon how you set up your catalogs. And um, you'll have two images sort of separate from each other, the RAW and then the TIFF or JPEG. In Photoshop, it works a little bit differently. I'm gonna show you how it works within Photoshop during this demonstration as well. So uh, this is Silver FX Pro 2, for anyone who's not familiar. It's built in with 48 different presets on the left side of the interface, and they are sort of heads up presets in that you can see exactly what your image would look like if you click on one of these presets. So really quick and easy sort of way of seeing the different potential of your image um, or different looks and feels that you can get out of these um, particular presets. I love what's happening with the wet rocks preset in this case, but we're gonna start from neutral on this image. And I wanna just take you directly over to the film types section of the interface and, and just apply one of the brand new film types that we've developed um, over the past few months. So um, in previous versions of Silver FX Pro 2, you had 18 of kind of the most popular black and white films. Um, in, in early January um, and, and working until now, basically, uh, we've developed, DxO has developed um, 10 more film emulations that I, I had my hand in as well, which is very exciting to get to um, uh, interact with and help create these kinds of um, developments with the Nick collection. But basically, these the new section here within the film types, these are the 10 brand new film types. And um, what we're doing is emulating what this photograph would have looked like had it been shot with these particular films. Um, and so they're found within the new section, and then they are also um, found sort of peppered into the different sections that they, that is appropriate. So the new Polaroid 667, that's a 3200 speed film. So you'll find that within the ISO 32 section here, um, as opposed to maybe the new Polaroid 672, which is a 400 speed film and has a completely different color and tonal response uh, than the, the other Polaroid. So you'll find that within the ISO 400. Um, so what I wanna do here is just find a preset or a film type that I think is appropriate for this particular image. I really love what's happening to the Foma pan or with the Foma pan 100 preset. So I'm gonna click on that. And once I've clicked on it, what, what the film types are actually doing is adjusting the, the grain structure that's overlaid on the image, uh, which we'll talk about, the color sensitivity. So that is how the colors in this original color image are being converted to black and white. And then there's also a specific curve applied to it uh, based upon this particular film type. So this is a, an emulation of the Foma Pan 100 Pro uh, uh, tonal response, uh, curve response. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about all of these things during the webinar, but just to sort of hit home with the color sensitivity sliders, because this is a good image to show you how these are working, this photograph is primarily made up of greens and yellows, and uh, we've got this nice high contrast curve from the Foma Pan curve, but we can actually go in and change and adapt these as well. So if I take this green slider and I slide it to the right, anything that's green within the photo, within the original color image, is going to get lighter, right? So any of that green stuff, we're making it more sensitive and so therefore more light would have been hitting the sensor or film, if you will, and it would be brighter because of that. The resulting uh, positive image would be brighter because of that. And so the beauty of these color sensitivities is that we can go in and change these after the fact to massage this, to get it, you can have it exactly how the film emulation creates the look and the feel, or you can go in and customize this stuff. And that's one of the beauties of shooting digital. We'll talk more about those kinds of beauties as well in a couple minutes, but I'm gonna just take a control point for now and um, dodge the lower right corner just a little bit. And I wanna add a little bit of contrast into the center here. I'm using control points, which is a tool uh, built into all of the Nick plugins. Specifically with silver effects, uh, we have control over, oops, wrong slider. Uh, we have control over brightness, contrast, structure, 
we can amplify the whites, amplify the blacks, find structure, and then there's even a selective colorization slider. So if I wanted to reintroduce color back into our black and white image, um, I could do that by placing a control point on the object or area where we wanted to reintroduce the color. And then using this selective colorization slider, we can um, go from zero selective colorization, so not getting any of the color back, all the way up to 100. So we can reintroduce all of that color based upon the selection that the control point is making. And actually, the control point here, what's happening here is it's looking for the similar tones, colors, and textures that we place the point on. And then we're able to dodge and burn or control any of those different aspects of, of the control point itself on the object that we place the point on, right? And so if I place the point over here on the right side of the image, and then I expand our area of influence out, this is gonna reach out to all of those leaves sort of on the right side of the frame and attempt to, in this case, add that selective colorization back in. Now, I'm not gonna leave that on there. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this control point. So while it's active, that is while the sliders are kind of out there so we can adjust them, I just hit the delete key on the keyboard, it gets rid of it. I like what we've got here. This is a great result. All I've done is added a FOMAPAN 100 classic preset, or, or film type rather. Um, I think I adjusted the green adjustment a little bit and then added a control point to the lower right into the center. Let's just take a quick look at the before and after using the compare button in the upper left corner. So here's the original file, the original um, raw image as we brought it into our Silver Effects Pro interface. And then here's our enhanced image with just a couple of clicks. We could probably spend another couple minutes in uh, really refining this photograph to polish it off to the nth degree. For now, we're gonna continue forward. So I'm gonna click the save button that's in the lower right corner of the interface. That's gonna save the file back into our host piece of software. In this case, Photo Lab 3. And therefore, uh, we will have our black and white image showing up within our film strip um, in the bottom of our interface here. So here's the original, and then here is our enhanced as it loads. So just a second here, I'm gonna go ahead and jump back over into the GoToMeeting interface to see if we've got any questions coming in. Um, so, got it, Dennis. Uh, Dennis is just a quick question here. Are we tied to the ISO number of black and white? For example, do I have to use 400 if I use 400 ISO in my camera? No, good question, great question. So you can shoot, when shooting digitally, you can shoot any ISO necessary to, to shoot the look that you're going for or in the lighting environment that you're trying to capture. Um, and then you can use any of the different film types, no matter what ISOs the original setting is. In fact, um, I'll, I'll show you that if you, you can actually kind of adjust the ISO, if you will, of our film types, because the, the ISO basically just governs over the amount of grain and the look of the grain, and you can adjust that within, um, within Silver Effects. Okay, so keep the questions coming, ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna save these for the end. It doesn't look like there are any, um, uh, any pressing questions coming in that, that I can't answer during the Q&A. Uh, the, the one question that has come in is, how do you resize the Silver Effects window? I'll show you that one. So um, let's, let's go into our next photo and let's sort of just briefly talk about the benefits of, of shooting uh, some film. Here's a beautiful photo by Lori Rubin. In fact, let's, let's open up this image. By the way, I'm not doing much, if any, image processing to these raw files. And, and in my own practice, I would go in and um, sort of massage the tones and colors. The, the beauty of this photo is it's basically perfect within camera with this beautiful lighting, um, and then the raw processing of Photolab. So it does a good job right off the bat. Um, so I don't really need to do too much. I'm gonna open Silver Effects again. So in the lower right corner, click on the Nick Collection button click into Silver Effects. Um, the question was, how do you resize the Silver Effects Pro interface? So once this opens, uh, there's actually a couple ways to resize the Silver Effects Pro interface. You can, uh, on a Mac or PC, there's gonna be an expand button. On a Mac, it's in the upper left corner. On a PC, I think it's in the upper right. Um, in this case, it's this green button. So you can expand that to go full screen. Or if you move the window, so you can move the window anywhere you want around, and then you can grab the lower right corner of the interface and just drag it out. So click and drag, and that's gonna yield you 
um, your larger or full screen kind of view. So let's click on a film type and, and let's just run through all of these different film types on this image. Um, as I scroll over each one, um, I, I want to kind of talk about some of the benefits or, or differences between shooting film and the thought process of film compared to digital. Um, the, you know, one of the beauties of, of film is that basically you choose the film stock and possibly the filter, if you're going to use a filter for black and white film or color film, um, based upon the result that you want, right? And then you actually use particular kinds of processors, processes and chemistry, um, different different chemistry to yield different results, right? And so the beauty of of shooting a particular film stock, and one thing that a lot of photographers have done in the past and still do as they shoot film, is they'll choose a particular film stock and they use that for a long, long time. Or they might have two or three or maybe four, probably at the most, uh, different film stocks that they will shoot um, and, and what happens is you get to know the response. So you understand exactly what's going to happen when you shoot in a particular situation, you process it, you look at it. So it's this slower process that is kind of thought out in a different way than shooting digital because you have to calculate, you have to plan ahead, you have to think about what's going to happen. And so one of the reasons I like to shoot film is it makes me think a different way than if I'm shooting digital. Even though you know exposure is basically the same in terms of ISO shutter speeds and, and f stops and so on and so forth, um, but because I only get 36 shots per 35 millimeter roll, or 10 or 12 or however many shots based upon a roll of 120 medium format film, or I might only have five sheets of 4x5 or 8x10 or 5x7 film. I have to think about making the exposure in a completely different way as opposed to shooting digital where you can still think in that way. But the, one of the beauties of digital is that you don't really have to because you have that sort of instant gratification of what you see on the back of the camera, what the histogram reads out on the back of the camera is basically what you're going to get. And then you can think about your post-processing once you get back to your computer. Um, so it's it's really just a, a different way of thinking about the approach and the look. And um, it, I don't want to say that film is limited, but film gives you a different thought process that limits your your thought process as to the different potential things that you would do with the image afterwards, um, only because of the the way that it captures. And I don't I I want to you know full disclosure I don't want to mention or say that like it's going to limit what you can do or how you think um it's just because what you get out of the film is based upon the exposure and film and process that's what you get and there isn't a lot of variation after the fact um unless you are an expert in the dark room right uh whereas the the beauty of shooting digital and uh, one of the benefits of shooting digital is that you you can um capture how you think you need to and then your raw files are going to be exceedingly malleable for post-processing. And actually, to, to show you that, I'm going to click on neutral for now. Uh, I'm going to move into the global adjustments. And I know I'm inviting a whole conversation um, as I, as I you know, make these comments. Um, and I'm trying to be careful not, um, not to, to word it incorrectly, because I, I am a digital shooter and photographer, and then I also photograph and film, but it actually could open up some interesting conversations. So what I'm doing here is just making some basic adjustments to the file as it's converted um, within the global adjustments section. And um, if we scroll into the color filter section and I click on the red color filter, what, what these filters are doing, are, are they are emulating what would happen um, when shooting black and white film with a particular filter in front of the lens. And um, when shooting, I think this is Yosemite now that I think of it, which, you know, shout out to Ansel Adams. Um, this is a Lori Rubin image, but anyways, I just sort of thought about that as Ansel was very well known for shooting with filters, knowing and understanding what's going to happen to his resulting negative and then what he would do in the dark room was all sorts of bleaching and dodging and burning and and work in the dark room to kind of get the look and the feel that he wanted but he knew what was going to happen when he was shooting in the field for the most part 
and then he would be able to um, adjust that how he saw fit. Um, the, the thing about shooting film is if I use a red color filter in front of my lens, I get that response. So I have to know what's happening and I have to expect what's gonna happen in my process, as opposed to if I have a color image shooting digitally and I go into silver effects like this, I can go in and choose which color filter I might want after the fact, right? And then just to explain what's happening here, as I click on the blue color filter, anything on the blue end of the color spectrum in the original image here is going to go bright. Anything on the opposite end of the color spectrum is going to get darker, basically. So if I click on the red color filter, this is sort of a fall foliage image. Um, in this photo, these trees are primarily reds and yellows, I think primarily yellow in this case whereas this tree is a little bit more green as an evergreen tree, um, you see it get much brighter. If I click on neutral, you'll see sort of the original color response, right? And, and so what's interesting about doing, you know, shooting digitally is that you can choose after the fact which of these color filters you might want to use. In fact, there's some advanced post-processing techniques where in Photoshop you use layers and you actually combine these different color filters together or you might combine different film types together. Uh, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back into color filter. We're gonna click on the red color filter, and then I'm just gonna reduce the strength. Yet another thing that you can do digitally here in silver effects, that would be um, impossible to do if you used like a 25A red color filter. Um, you get what you get out of that exposure based upon however you make the exposure in camera. Um, you could theoretically have different color reds, and that would give you yield you different intensities of the filter. But um, here, you know, we can just turn it up or turn it down with our beautiful little slider. So I'm going to set that red color filter to about 40%. Let's go into our film types. I think I like the HP5 in this case, and um, HP5 was a, a is a black and white film that Henry Cartier-Bresson used all of the time. He, he also liked Tri-X, um, which is actually a, a, a film, a Kodak film that uh, is a standby for so many photographers because of the versatility of the film. Uh, now, let's, let's talk about this. The, we had a question that came in about uh, resolving the, the idea of ISO. And the, the question was kind of like, uh, if I shoot ISO 400 in my digital camera, should I be using ISO 400 film stocks? And it's entirely up to you. And in fact, let's say you shoot ISO 100 in camera, uh, in your digital camera, and you would like to have a low grain black and white image. You could still go in and use um, one of your 400 speed films. So uh, let's go with the HP5. And um, let's go into the grain em emulator. In fact, I'm gonna zoom in a couple times. So here we're zoomed into 100% on our image. And um, you can see the grain that's, that's overlaid on the image. If we go to the grain per pixel slider, and I slide this slider all the way over to 500 grains per pixel, basically what you're gonna see here um, is no grain being generated by, or no noticeable drain, grain being um, generated by silver effects, as opposed to if I take my grain per pixel slider to the left, now I'm kind of emulating a, a larger grain type, and therefore what we're gonna get out of it is a more noticeable grain, which is going to emulate a higher ISO kind of film, right? So it's, it's entirely your choice. Um, and if you wanted to make your 400 speed film, so Ilford HP5, I'm just gonna reset the setting as I forgot what the original setting was set to. So it's set to 257 grains per pixel at a sort of middle of the road uh, hardness. And I'm gonna take this over to uh, 500 grain per pixel. And now we're sort of pretending as though we're shooting a 100 ISO or a very, very fine grained film type by bringing that grain per pixel over. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do is I really love this response, but I think that the, the, there's too much contrast. You can fix this a couple ways. I could go to the contrast slider in the upper right and just reduce the overall contrast if I wanted to. And if that yielded me the look that I like, I'd be happy with that. But the, the contrast that we're getting is coming from the levels and curve adjustment that is associated with the HP5 film. So if it were too high contrast, what we could do is start 
um, bringing that back down. In fact, I, the problem that I have in this image with this film type is that the shadows are kind of blocked up a little bit. So if I move to the lower left, I can I can add more of these points as as we see fit. Um, I can change the curve. And what I'm doing is I'm just raising that quarter tone up a little bit to get a little bit more detail out of this entire portion of the scene. As I do that, it's changing the overall contrast of the, of the look and the feel of the image. And technically, no, it's not HP5 anymore. Um, but what's cool about this is, you know, let's say you are a film photographer and you use HP5 and you um, use some sort of chemical process that or, and shooting technique that yields you a lower contrast result in camera, in, in, in the film, and in your prints, maybe. Um, what you can do is start out with the Il Ilford HP5 preset film type, adjust your curve so that it matches your digital images to maybe your film images, um, and then save it as a preset. Right? And in fact, to, to save these things as presets, you'd move over to the left side of the interface. I've hidden my presets. I'm going to go ahead and show them again um, by clicking this button in the upper left corner. And what we're going to do is go into the custom section, and we're going to save this as a custom uh, Ilford HP5 uh, preset. So to do that, you click the plus button. That's to the right of the, the word custom. And then you name your custom preset. So I'm going to name this one. Um, HP5, oops, HP5, and I'm going to say, um, how about ISO 50, which isn't an actual film um, that I know of anyways, ISO 50 and lowered contrast. So what we're going to get here is just a naming convention that's going to maybe match um, the, the process that I like digitally or maybe a, a, a film process that I'm using. So now we've got our nice preset there. And of course, we can go in with control points and start to dodge and burn and direct the viewer's attention through the photograph. So the, the film types are your starting point as with any of these kinds of global adjustments. And then you move in and you start dodging and burning selectively to direct the viewer's attention through the image, just like what you would do in the darkroom. Um, and, and you know, the interesting part here is that I, I don't have to worry uh, about putting my hands in the chemistry. I don't have to worry about mixing chemistry, which can be cathartic at the same time. Um, and I don't have to worry about waste, not wasting, spending the time uh, waiting for prints to come out of the chemistry to figure out that I need to do something different in my printing technique. Um, here I can see it right as we go. It's just another one of those sort of beautiful benefits of what's happening when shooting digitally. Okay, I'll move my notes. Let's take a look at the side-by-side -side here. So I'm gonna click on the side-by-side -side preview. Um, the left image is the original raw that we've converted from color to black and white. On the right, we have our adjusted image with the HP5 and some control points here and, there, here and there to direct the viewer's attention. I think we, again, could probably spend another five or 10 minutes really directing the viewer's attention through the image, but I'm much more drawn, in this case, to the right side image, this, this finished photograph. So I love what's going on with it. Let's click the Save button. This is going to bring us back over into our uh, host piece of software. And actually, I'm going to launch this next image, which is not really a photographic image, but it's a good test photograph for being able to see what's happening uh, to our photographs. Um, and to colors and tonal responses. And I can kind of walk you through what's happening a little bit more. So I'm gonna export this photo from Photolab over into Photoshop. To do that, you click the Export to Application button in the lower right corner. And um, by default, in my case, it says Export to. We've got the Adobe Photoshop. I've got a 16-bit file, it looks good. I'm gonna work with my Adobe 1998 um, profile. So I'll just click Export. And then this file is gonna launch over into Photoshop. Um, as that happens, and that was very fast, actually. I was going to jump over to go to meeting and see what's happening. Okay, cool. So it doesn't seem like anybody's lost connection or anything, which is what I'm, I'm looking for primarily when I jump over into that go to webinar control panel. So we've got Photoshop just launched. Um, here's our image. And let's resize this screen and resize the photo. Um, one of the beauties of working from Photoshop is the fact that you have layers and layer masks and blending modes and smart objects and all of the other bells and whistles and beautiful things that you can work with uh, when, when 
working in a photographic process digitally. Um, it, it basically, in my mind, opens up a whole lot of opportunities. And so what I'm finding is happening, um, I, I primarily utilize Photolab 3 as a raw processor and sort of as an organizational tool uh, with my folder structure. And I really love Photolab 3 because of the use of control points. There's some great optical options as well for correcting lens corrections and stuff like that. And then um, I will oftentimes, if I know I'm going to be needing layers and layer masks, open an image from Photolab over into Photoshop so that I can use those capabilities. There's a lot of situations where that's not necessary, where I'll just utilize, let's say, the Nick plugins from Photolab. But um, some of those benefits of uh, the Photoshop capability is those layers, layer masks, and blending modes. Now, um, there was a floating palette that was just sitting there a second ago. I'll show you what happens uh, when we go back over into Photoshop because the software launched way faster than I thought it was going to. So basically, we're here within Silver Effects, and I launched the software from the Nick Selective tool in Photoshop uh, right into Silver Effects Pro. And all I want to do here is walk you through our color wheel and then uh, our step chart here and show you a couple things. First of all, there's a little trick in Silver Effects to be able to see the original color information from the photograph, from the original photo. And that is, um, I'm gonna click on that preset that we made just to make some changes. I'm gonna click on a couple of these presets. There we go. So we've made a couple changes. That stuff is getting recorded in the history state browser. So if you follow my cursor to the lower left of the interface, I move into the word history and just click on that. This is the history state browser. It allows us to um, basically record everything that we do while we're here within Silver Effects. If I click the compare button right now and hold it, um, we're gonna see the original neutral black and white state or conversion. Right, so I'm pressing and holding the compare button and you can actually see where it says neutral right here over on the left side. And then this little sort of tick chart comes up, right? And what we're able to do is actually click on um, this little uh, state indicator and you can uh, click through to the different states and I can actually get a comparison of the Dan Fuji Pan New Neo, wow, Dan Fuji Neo Pan 400 preset that I used created, and then um, the difference between the HP5, right? So by clicking and dragging this, you see a different before and after. So now we're seeing um, the HP5, and then here we're seeing the Dan Fujipan uh, Neo. Oh, no, it's opposite. Sorry, I let go, and I'm seeing this preset, the highlighted one, and when I hold the compare button, I'm seeing the HP5 ISO 50, right? If I click and drag this up to the original image, now when I hold the compare button, I actually see the original color photograph compared to where I am now. And so one of the benefits here is it's, a, it's easy to see how our black and white, or how our colors are being converted to black and white. So um, you know, note that the top portion towards the left, these are these warm colors, red through yellow. We move into greens and cyans and then blues and magentas as we make our way across. And I point that out because if I click on my um, film types and I just scroll over each one, you're seeing the color and tonal response based upon how those colors are being converted from color to black and white. And each one of these film types yields a completely different response in those colors, right? And so Silver Effects is obviously using all of this color information in the conversion, but based upon your film type choice, you will also be changing how the colors are converted from color to black and white. And so the, the beauty here is that, again, we're emulating these different kinds of films. So here we have the Kodak 400 T-Max film, uh, or let's say we go to the Tri-X. So this is that sort of standby that, that all sorts of folks used and have used over the years since it's been developed. Um, and uh, as we move through these different film types, you're seeing these different responses, right? It's beautiful, it's wonderful, and it's a nice way of sort of seeing what's gonna happen. Now, that doesn't help us photographically sort of get inspiration, I understand that, but um, it is a nice way of being able to see exactly how these colors are converting. So this is the Agfa Scala, and so it's, it's taking sort of the reds and magentos and making them pretty dark, and then a part of the blue, and also making it pretty dark, as opposed to the Adox, which yields 
a brighter overall color response, yet actually more contrast overall than the Ag Scala. So, so watch the little chart in the lower right corner as well. There's the ADOX Silvermax compared to the Scala, which just has a, the ADOX is a high contrast going from white to black in, in the sort of mid-range high contrast going from uh, light tones to dark tones very quickly, as opposed to a more kind of fuller tonal range of the Agatha Scala film type. And so you, you would choose different film types based upon the, the result that you're getting and how much work you want to do in post-processing in the darkroom. Um, and so the Scala works really nicely if you know you're going to be uh, wanting a good tonal range in the midtones and then also a pretty even response of colors from color to black and white. That is from your original color image into your black and white film. Um, now, I, I don't want to get too technical here, so I'm going to skip over some of the other notes that I actually jotted down. But what I do want to do is show you um, the zone mapping system that's in the lower right corner of the interface, and I've also placed a zone system sort of section here in this image as well. So if we move into our loop and histogram, in the lower right of the interface, I've just clicked on the word loop and histogram, it opens it up. Um, you can actually toggle between a loop, which follows your cursor around, and then also the histogram. So I'll go, oops, sorry, go back into the histogram, in the very bottom portion of the histogram, uh, you also have a zone system or a zone mapping system. And so what this does is it's an indicator system to tell you what zones relating to the actual photographic zone system developed in the uh, early 20th century by Ansel Adams and the F64 group. A few other photographers helped sort of develop that system. Um, and what you're seeing here is how your color image is converting from color to black and white in its tones. Zone 10, this furthest zone, and it's actually kind of hard to see in this case. Zone 10 is anything that's just stark paper white. There's nothing there. Uh, zone 9, zone 8, and zone 7, those are those lighter tones. And so you can see them showing up with these little indicator lines, I hope anyways. let's. I'm going to zoom in even further, get an even better feel for what's going on. We can't see the whole um, zone system at this case, or in this case, but pretty close. So um, as I scroll over to zone five, it's actually rendering in this case on the zone four section because of the difference between the gradient that I have and then the zone mapping system. But note, the important ones to really pay attention to is zone zero being completely and totally black with devoid of detail, so totally black, and then zone 10, which is totally white, right? And so typically you want to work in between those constraints right, in your black and white process, um, simply because if you're going to go to, uh, if you're going to print something, you probably want to print stuff that should have dark details above zone one, probably, and then if you need something to be completely black, you can let it go to zone one and below, um, and then if you want highlights, like you might have a specular highlight in an image, I'm going to click OK here, just to apply this. You might have a specular highlight in an image, which is like a reflection off of a mirror or window or something like that, um, or a shiny thing um, that goes to zone 10. But oftentimes you want to retain texture and detail in the brighter values, and therefore you use the zone mapping system to get an idea if that's going to happen, if you're going to be able to retain your detail uh, within those brightest values or darkest values. So here in Photoshop, we are working with our layers. You have your original background and then um, a duplicated layer up above that. I'll show you that one more time. I just want to jump into an actual photograph instead of spending a whole bunch of time on, um, on an image that isn't really a photograph. Uh, I guess it's, anyways, yeah. Um, I'm going to delete this copy. I don't need that. And actually go back to Photoshop and just close that file out, not save it. And then we're going to go to this Jeff King image. So we've got this nice portrait here. And we're going to go ahead and um, bring this over into Photoshop. Uh, Jeff King is an Iditarod racer, and I believe he's won the Iditarod the horse, not horse, uh, dog sled uh, race up in Alaska. I think he's won three times. And correct me if I'm wrong. This is funky. There's an error that happened going over into Photoshop. 
So I wonder what I've done. It didn't like opening into Photoshop. I'm going to quit Photoshop for just a second. Let's see if we can do this again. Remove, we got a little eye, or what's going on here? Some kind of error happening. Let's clear all of those. And then let's see if I can open that up. It's, it looks like it's getting mad at me. A little exclamation point. Of course, that's what's going to happen during my demo. So um, Photoshop is going to have to open back up. But uh, this is a Jeff King portrait. I think it works nicely because we've got this wide range of tones from the shadow in his shirt to the highlights of uh, the dog's belly here. And then a whole bunch of different colors from the blue of the background to the green of the trees and the red. Um, and this is very mad at me for some reason. Uh, so let me go into Photoshop. Photoshop hasn't even opened yet. This is concerning. It worked a minute ago. So maybe we are going to have to pivot and not open. Let's see if it, it'll take this TIFF file. Photoshop is not liking that at all. All right. So one last attempt, find in Finder, drag directly to Photoshop. Let's see if this works. There we go. Okay, don't know what was going on there. Something's weird. But anyways, um, we're here within Photoshop. We've got our uh, sort of full tonal range image. I don't have anything that's totally blown out and white, uh, although parts of Jeff's hair are up there in tone. So what we want to do is see if we can retain texture in that hair as we uh, move into our silver effects workflow. So uh, this is the Nick Selective tool. I kind of skipped going over this on the last photo. I know a lot of folks are probably familiar with it, but this is one of the ways that you access the Nick plugins from Photoshop. Um, I can just click right into Silver Effects Pro 2, or if the Nick Selective tool isn't coming up, I can actually go up to the uh, Filter drop-down menu, go into the Nick collection, and then click directly into Silver Effects Pro 2. It's another way of opening into any of the different plugins. So let's click on Silver Effects. The software is going to launch. And um, so film choices are completely subjective, right? You, you choose a film based upon the kinds of environments that you might be shooting in. Like if you're in a really bright environment, you can shoot lower ISOs at sort of hand-holdable shutter speeds, uh, just like a digital image or digital camera. And um, if you're in lower light situations, you might opt for a high ISO film type because it's going to yield you hand-holdable <laughs> kinds of shutter speeds in the environment that you're shooting. But you might also choose different film types because of their color response, because you might want more or less grain. Um, I know photographers who love um, a P3200 and, and were stoked when Kodak released it again uh, just very recently over the past year or so. And they love it because it's this nice high contrast film that yields really beautiful grain structure, right? And so here I've, I've clicked on the P3200 uh, speed film and actually we don't even get that much grain um, with this particular film. If we wanted more grain, uh, what we would do is slide that grain per pixel slider uh, to the right. And I do understand that this is a particular look and maybe I don't want it on this portrait, but there are lots of situations where this heavy handed grain might be appropriate and really quite beautiful. I, I love a really wonderful landscape image uh, where the, the grain actually can help to abstract the scene even further let's say on a long exposure image, um, and it can be really quite interesting. Um, so photographers will in, have chosen film you know, for exposure and, and basically because of the lighting situations that they might be in, but also because of the color and tonal response. Um, in this case, I absolutely love this photograph with this Berger BRF 400 Pro. It's got this really nice silvery effect. It's not terribly high contrast. We are retaining texture and detail. And I, I love, I guess what it is, is the color sensitivity. It, it just yields these simple little bits of contrast between the different colors in the photo. And in fact, just to show you, let's click this compare button in the upper left corner. This is the original exposure. So it has a nice kind of base to it already. Um, and then here is our 
our preset, the Berger BRF 400 plus. So it isn't a really dramatic change. It's about the subtleties of it. Um, and I love what's happening. I love the contrast in his genes that's happening, the separation between his pup on, on his leg. And it just has this really beautiful lyrical feel to it. But it's not perfect for me anyways. Um, and what I wanna do is actually increase uh, the contrast a little bit. So I'm gonna move into the levels and curves and I'm gonna just subtly bring the highlights up a little. No, I brought it up too much, there we go, just a touch. And then I'm gonna bring the shadows down, actually down here, just a little bit. So there's just a touch more kind of pop. And all I did was I clicked. So if you wanna add an extra point to a curve here, you just click on the, the curve itself and then you can actually drag that wherever you want. You have to be careful because now I basically inverted a whole bunch of tones kind of creating a Sabatier effect, a kind of like solarization, but not, not what I'm after in this case. To get rid of a point off of the level and curve, you just double click and it's gonna delete that curve or that point for us. So I'm loving what's happening on this portrait with this Berger uh, film. So from there though, I do wanna add some control points here and there and just very quickly dodge and burn so I can open up a landscape image and talk to you about some choices you might make for let's say landscape photography as well. Um, you know, it's again, it's completely subjective. But the the beauty of these things is that there are um, tried and true kinds of techniques that folks have been using for quite a long time. Uh, I'm going to dodge his shirt just a little bit. Actually, we're going to use the Amplify Whites slider. Watch what happens with this slider. So I'll move down towards his shirt. Um, and we could take this brightness slider to the right. And that's going to do one thing. Obviously, that's too much dodging. I can maybe bring it up to 23%. Um, but Watch what happens if I bring the Amplify Whites slider up instead of the um, Brightness slider. So what's going on is it the this control point goes in and it finds the lightest values in this object, so in this case his shirt, and it brightens up those values. And so what I'm getting out of the Amplify Whites is, is a more refined kind of dodge in this case, a more refined brightening of those tones without sort of flattening everything out, right? If I actually double click on that slider, it homes it, and I go to my brightness slider, watch what happens. If I, if I take my brightness slider up to, let's say 23, we get a similar brightness kind of response, but it's also brightening the shadows the same amount as the, the brighter tones on that object, as opposed to Amplify Whites, where what that's doing is it's trying to find the very brightest values and of the object that we place the point on and um, allows us to brighten those up as we amplify those whites. Um, two last control points. And, and you might note that control points kind of just show up on my image. Uh, what I'm doing is using a shortcut, Shift Control A, on a Mac or Shift Command A on a PC, right? No, it's Shift Command A on a Mac, Shift Control A on a PC. Uh, and this gives us the crosshair so that we can create a new control point without having to move over to the tools palette. Uh, the last thing that I wanna do on this image is move into the finishing adjustments. We haven't talked anything about any of these finishing adjustments and I'm just gonna burn the bottom edge. So I'm gonna, let's burn it to 100% which is just darkening that bottom edge. We'll encroach a little bit further with the size slider, take my transition up just a touch, and then I'm gonna reduce the strength until I, I like the resulting effect. And the idea here is that that burned edge is just sort of gonna push your attention as the viewer up towards our subject that much more. Um, with that, let's take a gander at our before and after. So let's do a side-by-side -side preview. On, on the left is the original raw image. It's, I, I think it converts nicely into black and white kind of on its own, but on the right, we've got our more refined look and feel. And of course, this is, these are my choices, right? This is totally subjective, but we chose a film type, we've used control points, we've used our uh, burn edges effect, and now I've got a photo that uh, pops a little bit more and I think displays our subject um, a, a little bit more true to uh, how I remember him being when we shot these photos. So I'm gonna click this okay button. That's gonna bring us back over into Photoshop. And somehow we've hit 1151. Oh man, my Photoshop quit. Cool, great. So we've hit 1151. So we'll transition into a Q&A. I have several more pictures to talk about, but uh, 
we, we don't have the time to be able to do that. Uh, so let's transition into a q and I'm going to add a control point to this gentleman's face and just dodge his face a little bit. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to type them into the questions box and uh, we'll, we'll handle them from there. Here we're in photo lab and I just added a control point to this gentleman's face. It's just a really beautiful way of controlling and dodging and burning different parts of the photo. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, um, any questions you might have, feel free uh, to type them in and uh, I'll try and answer them over the next 10 minutes or so. So thanks again for coming out to the webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Please feel free to come to any and all of these webinars. And if you ever have any questions on regards to any of these processes that we talk about, if you something you learned maybe in this webinar, come on back to one of the other webinars and feel free to ask um, any question that, that you might have. Um, if we do it ahead of time, like if I see a question that comes in before the start of the webinar, I can answer it via text as well. I can uh, message you. Um, via the go to webinar control panel, uh, or if you don't mind waiting till the end of the webinar, I'll just throw it in with the rest of the, um, the Q and A. So uh, I've got a couple comments that have come in and a couple thank yous. Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to make sure we do answer these things. John, thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words. And Dennis, thank you. Learned a lot. That's great to hear. Um, do you plan to have a webinar on the basics of Photo Lab 3? So I, I do have a webinar that's coming up. Geez, I think it's it's either the 17th. Yeah, it is the 17th. So um, that would be next Tuesday. We are going to talk about not the basics overall, Bob, of using uh, DxO Photo Lab 3, but it's the basics of and three tips utilizing the um, control point, the selective capability of both the NIC collection as well as DxO Photo Lab. So um, that isn't a basic webinar necessarily about Photo Lab 3 specifically. And Bob, I, I think I, I have to talk to DxO because I do these webinars for DxO. I don't technically work directly for DxO. I would love to do a webinar for and specifically DxO. I don't know if that would be housed here because these are the webinars that are specific to Nick software for DxO. So, you know, great question. I have to ask if I can even do it, um, would love to, but um, we would probably have to put that up somewhere. Maybe, maybe it could go here, I'm not sure, but great question. Um, so Bob, you said you upgraded to Nick, but the films do not show up in Nick software. So Bob, you're saying that the, the new, film types that I was showing today aren't showing up in your version of the Nick collection. W would you be able to check which Nick collection you have, Bob? Because I want to say it's um, 2.4. Let me let me look. So let me go back over into, maybe Lori can jump in um, to the most recent version of the Nick collection. Oh, don't know why I did that. That's not going to tell me which version I'm in. I think if I open the Nick plugin, I can actually get which version of um, the software we're in. And that would be the most recent version of the software, as far as I know. Alex, thank you very much. I'm glad everybody came out. Very comprehensive, interesting. Great. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. Um, how can I do that? So, so Bob, let's let's see. I remember if I click on the Nick logo in the upper right corner of one of the Nick plugins, it tells us um, the version of the Nick plugins. And actually, this says I'm on version um, V2.3.0, which I thought was 0.4 was the newest one. But um, you, Bob, if you have 2.3 or newer, um, you you should have the Nick collection with the new. Um, film types. If not, what you'll want to do is go to, if you've updated to the DxO version, you'd want to go to um, DxO, the Nick software website, and you can actually download the software again. And uh, you'll have to re-enter your serial number, but you would basically be downloading the newest version of the software. And that will write over the older version of the software. Um, go to help in the lower left corner and see if you can upgrade from there. Oh, even better idea. So hey, Bob, thank you, Lori. Um, down in the lower left corner of the interface, there's a help button, of course. And that help button is going to bring you to the customer service page. 
Um, and then you should be able to navigate from here uh, once you've you know noticed which version of the software you're on. And um, you've got all the different options here. And then there's a, probably a download link in here as well, or a way of doing that. Oh, we're in Silver Effects specifically. We would want to be in um, installation and activation or upgrades and purchases. So check those. Thanks, Lori. All right, so I've got a couple questions that are up a little bit higher in, in the Q&A part. So uh, with all respect, 17 minutes into the presentation, we are now only getting to the second of the different film stock emulations. Glenn, thank you for your feedback. I think short videos would be helpful in these different film stocks. Thank you though, Glenn, for pointing that out. Um, we got that one, good morning. So uh, I've been using Lightroom catalog to manage my images. I'm new to the Nick collection and now having access to PhotoLab, I'd like to try it. Can I access the files in the same location as they are stored in for Lightroom or will the physical copy be imported somewhere into PhotoLab 2? Great question. Um, Dominique, if you're still there, well, I'll just answer it. So the, the question is in regards to um, a, a Lightroom user is interested in using PhotoLab and um, wondering how file management works, basically, I think, anyways. So PhotoLab 2 and PhotoLab 3, they, they will not move your files physically. So if I jump over into PhotoLab, Um, and I move into my photo library. So this is sort of like the, the, the um, browsing capability. So the, in the browsing section here, we've got, um, sorry, <clears throat> we've got all of our different windows, all of our different folders. And uh, basically we are browsing these folders. If I click into, let's say the analog workflow webinar, these are all of the images that I use there. As I click on these, we're not moving any of the images. Uh, they just exist in this, this folder structure. And it would work with whatever folder structure you have and you are using as a Lightroom user. So it doesn't move anything. And it actually is really quite nice because it just works as a browser. Um, and what that ends up doing is, is working very, very quickly. Once you've rendered the previews here that sort of sit within PhotoLab, um, you can get full res renders very quickly. Like let's say I click on this image of the Sean Bory step well and I click into customize, I click into it and, and basically I've got my full res file right there, right? I can, I can just zoom in and see uh, my full res. Cool. Thanks Keith, I appreciate it. Yes, Dominic, you could totally use the same raw files and I would suggest it um, because as you use PhotoLab, you're not actually changing any of the data itself. It it works kind of like Lightroom is in that it's a parametric image editor. It's Pyware. Uh, it generates a sidecar file, a .dop, I think is what it's called. And that sidecar file retains all of the information of the adjustments that you've made uh, within PhotoLab. So it doesn't it doesn't change any of your raw files at all. It just writes uh, a sidecar file that is the adjustments of your file itself. So it's quite nice and it's non-destructive and you can always go back and re-edit the photograph as you see fit and as necessary. Good question. All right. I don't think there are any more questions that have come into the questions box. So I just want to thank everybody for coming out to the webinar today. Uh, have an absolutely fantastic day. Enjoy the software. Come on back to any and all of these webinars when you get the opportunity. Uh, we'd love to see you and uh, enjoy your Nick software. Thanks again, ladies and gentlemen.